to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 79, End Generation Project, offering guidance on scripture, featuring Mike from COT. This episode originally aired on May 27, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. For more details, check the link in the description below. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore eschatology and navigate today's challenges in this captivating episode. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website linked below. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and seeking the Most High's guidance. Your support helps us guide individuals towards truth sobriety and preparedness for the perilous times foretold in scripture join our exclusive locals community for egp family members and enjoy early access to exciting content thank you for being an integral part of the end generation project's success before diving into today's rebroadcast podcast episode 79 end generation project offering guidance on scripture we're thrilled to introduce our brand new merchandise line Our selection includes high-quality t-shirts, mugs, and bags, each designed to inspire and remind you of your faith journey. Every purchase directly supports the operation of this channel, helping us to continue creating valuable content and providing guidance. Your support through these purchases is vital. It allows us to reach more people, offer more insightful episodes, and expand our mission. By shopping with us, you're not just getting great products, you're making a meaningful impact on our community. Visit our store now to explore our collection and help sustain our efforts. Thank you for your continued support and generosity. May the Lord keep you all always. Blessings from EGP. Evidently, I'm going to have to retrain the AI. Just have to love technology. I'm going to have to retrain it because it's not familiar with my uh, voice, evidently. It went cuckoo, actually, through some system updates. And one of its uh, brains was taken off. It has to relearn my voice, which takes about two hours. So after two broadcasts, it should be okay. After two. And the whole point behind that, it picks up subtle commands and does things while I'm talking. That's good. Hope that you guys are okay today. Aside from the storms, I do realize many of you are going through storms, many storms, and pop-up storms. But, but, how many warning do we need? Somebody look up how many other countries are having storms like we are. The USA. Let's just get down to business, shall we? Somebody says, uh, get your marble in your mouth. I have my mouthpiece in. It's in there. No, we have a in-house AI system I built. It's my AI. I built it. And um, it learns voices. That way, if I'm ever, we could be in the middle of an, um, uh, I don't know, a turbine room or something like that. You guys would not hear the turbine, just my voice. So it listens for all the noise. And it can, if it recognizes my voice, it'll pick it out of all the noise. Right, And then we'll put my voice together and transmit it so that the sound is clear. Right now I'm clapping my hands. You can't hear it. Right now I'm beating on the desk. You can't hear it. Right? There are lots of noises all around me. You can't hear it. Because of AI. As it learns my voice, it gets better and better and better. So anybody who comes on air, we start taking, um, you know, having people join us. It'll learn their voice in about, I'll say about two, three minutes. And it will do its little filtering thing. And that's its entire job is for voices. That's one AI unit. The other one learns the system here at uh, COT, environmental systems, Um, all these different systems. And so it can assist. It is in-house. It is not networked. And it must never be networked. So it's in-house. It does, you know, it assists us. Of course, I made it, right? I made it. I'm very familiar with uh, neural nets. And so I made one. No big deal. It's in-house. Christian AI. It does have, it is biased. It's very biased. It hates cursing. It loathes cursing. Right? It knows scripture. Right? It likes context and correctness. 
So it corrects me a lot. I mean, a lot. And it does. I mean, a whole lot. Uh, right now, it does not speak. It can type. But it loves scripture. And it does. There are certain things I say it does not like when I say it. It just does. So there we are. And it is. It's just a computer, guys. Hey, uh, let me let me give you a tell you what AI does. AI can take, say, for example, based on what it's doing, it can take and simulate uh, responses. It can simulate things. So it can take when I'm speaking, simulate my speech against all the data that's in its brain. And it will see a probable outcome with a point system. The higher the point system, the more pleased it is. Right? So it goes through about 100 million per word. So if you're speaking to it, it's going to process about 100 million simulations per word. It's going to pick out the best uh, output based on a point system, certain points, what is acceptable, what is not. And then it will let you know if it likes it or not. Right? It does give, it gives great advisement. Uh, it does watch the chat room. And the whole sole purpose behind that is because it will assist you guys. For example, if you can't find a scripture, it can do that for you. If you can't remember a name, or you're describing something, you can go pull up a probable, you know, thing you're looking for in the Word of God. If you get something mixed up, it can give you gentle correction. Right? If you're cursing, it can give you a timeout. It is going to assist the admins. Of course, they have absolute, you know, autonomy over that. Um, but it it will it it does pick up on conversations. It can also sense emotional overtones. It can also sense when a person is out of character, and it gives these small recommendations. You know, some people fit the profile. Of, they have been drinking. Don't worry about it, though. Right? If if you drink, you drink. You do. Um, I'm not telling you I'm accepting of that. Here's what I am telling you that. Every decision you make towards your Lord has to be your decision, not mine, not anybody else's. You have to choose. And that choice must be from your heart. It can't be some, uh, you know, pressure decision. So you have to do what you have to do and work out your salvation. You have to do that, right? No human being has a right to make you choose anything concerning your father. Your father works in the realm of truth. Each individual must by themselves and the Lord choose according to the truth the Lord has given them. That's what you have to do. And that's what you've been doing, right? I cannot, uh, I can't induce a person to, or, or sit there and give my opinion. My opinion is useless uh, when it comes to things like that. You must discover based off the truth of what the Lord has given you, what is acceptable and what is not. You must align to the Lord according to what he has given you. You see how that works? That's called freedom. That's called liberty. And you have liberty to choose. I will never overstep the authority the Lord is. He's not exacted himself. For example, the Lord does not choose for you. The Lord does not stop evil on the earth and all this that, and the other. He didn't do that. He's allowing people to choose. Why? Because he's about to do something. He's given humanity a long period of time to mature, to have information available to everybody, to have the word of God available should they choose to go into it, to build a relationship with the Messiah should they choose it, to be exposed to all types of knowledge. He's given that liberty. For the most part, people have made their choice. I give you an example. In politics, God has also given them a choice. They choose to continue to fight each other. And because of that, I'll tell you this. One more time, a period of grace is given, and then the house will be uprooted in a very painful way. If they don't choose what's right, if they don't choose humanity, they will be uprooted. And that will be that. That's our father. Just like when he pleads with other nations, what you see in the Middle East has already been prophesied, been laid out piece by piece. If people continue to choose prideful things like being right, they will be uprooted. 
How is that going to happen? He's going to give them over to a dark system. No one will be able to stop it. You will see people drawn to darkness, and you will have no power to stop it. And when they're drawn fully into darkness, and when they're clumped together, and when they sing victory and have their chance, they're going to be uprooted forever. So get ready for that. Also, if you've been looking at the schedule in the last hour or so, there is a serious matter I'll be talking about. I don't think, yeah, I did Friday. I put it there Friday. Friday, we're going to talk about something that's very real. It does come out of the KD files, but it's very real, and we're going to be talking about it. It's time, so we're going to talk about it. Some people have suspected one of the telltale components that I believe everybody should know about. It's called Jupiter. The father didn't make a mistake and putting all those planets out there. Yes, men like to discover various facts about them, but they are indicators of much larger things. Jupiter is an indicator, a luminary, that will always indicate what's next for us. I'll give you a mystery. You ready? Mystery. How many of you think Jupiter is heated from the inside out? How many? Anybody? We're talking Jupiter itself. You think it's heated from the inside out or the outside in? Yet, no, nobody can get into the KD files because they're not published yet. The first series of KD files publishes Sunday night around 10 p.m. And they're already ready to go. I'm just postponing the publishing until Sunday night at 10 p.m. It'll be central time. Somebody said, how would we know? Through NASA, JPL, all these space agencies that you get your weather, your volcanic data from, earthquake data from, you know, all those places that we don't trust. I'm being sarcastic with that because that's what we do. We say we don't trust NASA, JPL, right? The government, all these different places, but that's where we get the information from for earthquakes. Somebody says, outside in. What do you guys think the internal temperature of Jupiter is? Compared to the outside. Anybody? What's hotter, the outside or the inside? When you have the upper atmosphere, right, around 1,000 degrees Celsius, 1,000 plus degrees Celsius, what do you think the inside is? Anybody, you think it's hotter, right? Does that even make sense? How can something heat itself from the outside in? That's weird. Wouldn't you say that that doesn't work out at all? Does it? Is anything like that? No, most things are heated from the inside out. The sun is hotter on the inside than on the outside. The earth is hotter on the inside than on the outside. Mars is hotter on the inside than all planets are hotter on the inside than on the outside, right? What about Jupiter? Is Jupiter hotter on the inside or on the outside? You know what the answer is? The answer is Jupiter is a little cooler. Just a tiny bit cooler on the inside, not much, just a little bit cooler. So that doesn't constitute anything. The further you go down, the cooler it gets, except for one spot. Do you guys know the hottest spot of Jupiter? It is hotter than anything anybody could ever imagine. Take a wild guess. Your father always makes the truth visible if you just look at it again. But you can't listen to propaganda. You can't be biased. You can't have your pride hurt should you ever be wrong. Somebody named it the spot. Did you know that the spot of Jupiter is feeding all the heat for Jupiter? The spot is not the core of Jupiter, but the great red spot is feeding the heat of that entire planet. Did you know that? That's a fact. It's not, you know, dreamland fantasy. That's a fact. And that's just with Jupiter. Imagine the secrets the other planets hold in truth. But why would Jupiter be like that? What in the world could be happening? Is that simply a storm? No, it is not. We're going to cover things like that. We'll do that Friday. Jupiter is an indicator. I know people have heard lots of stories about Jupiter. You guys know I believe in a I believe we live in a binary system, not three, not four, not five, just two. I believe that. I do believe that. I also believe 
that even though we live in a binary system, it does not mean a second perturber is not out there and it's not Jupiter. Jupiter is being affected by something. Jupiter is going to give us the first indication by way of its light. Jupiter is going to light up like a light bulb. That will be our indication. A while back, they found something lurking outside of our solar system. It's been in a place that they have looked a thousand times before. They couldn't see it. They have looked at the same spot time and time again. They couldn't see anything. There was no reading of anything special in that area. Then one day, by accident, they found something by accident. Something so devastating that it has power to destroy everything. And they found it by accident. It had no signature whatsoever. And they found it by accident. You know what they found? You guys know what they found? They published this. What was that? They published this um, not too many years ago. But it kind of went under the radar. Anybody? A black hole. They found a real black hole right outside of us. Just out there. Doing something. So they studied that black hole. And the properties and found that it was a very strange black hole. Very odd one. You know, they're still looking at that black hole. Do you know that? They're quite worried about that black hole. Do you know that? Because we live in a binary system, I do believe, we have a second system coming very close to our system. This will undo the nature of what people call reality. But we also have that black hole to contend with. And whatever garbage, it will draw into itself. Do you guys know that uh, a strange fact most of the Earth's population lives within 10 miles of the ocean. Do you guys know that? Most. Most of humanity lives within 10 miles of the ocean. You guys do know that, right? Do you know what would happen if anything ever came close enough to our sun? One of the first telltale signs would be gravitational changes. And those gravitational changes will take effect on our moon as is happening now because our tidal, our tidal pool would change. It would weaken and strengthen. In effect, it would cause coastal flooding all around the globe every day. And because most people live in coastal cities, there would be a lot of people who would be in trouble. As it turns out, to destroy a great portion of this earth, is only to take out the coastal cities. That's it. You don't have to go inland. You don't. Because gravitational changes would surely release some of these already broken ice sheets. We would have a water problem. When the tide would come in, it would wipe out coastal cities and the people with it. It wouldn't kill everybody. But again, most of the populace of this earth lives within 10 miles. 10 miles of the ocean. That's a very strange fact. Nevertheless, it's a fact. It is a fact. Jupiter, again, is going to signal this change. But there won't be anything after that. Unfortunately, people will see that and likely take pictures because no one's going to tell them what comes next. One thing, I guess one thing people, they hear the stories of something out there. They do. They have read the ancient stories of something they came in with. Yes, they have. But have people taken that under consideration as being truth? Because if they did, they would be doing everything they could now. They would understand that life is precious and time is waning. But what would a person do? If they knew about some impending disaster, would you change your life? Give up your life? That's why we have talks like these. What would a person do? In all honesty, what would a person do? What would you do? If you found out or knew for a fact that within a matter of months, any things would change on the earth and not for the better for most people, what would you guys do? How would your life be altered? What problem do you have now that wouldn't be a problem anymore? What problems would be exacerbated? Have you given it that thought? We read about prophecy. We do. We say we believe in prophecy. 
Why are people not preparing? Why? I talk about the weather a lot. Storms, wind, floods. Other people, they hear it. They did nothing about it. We know the consequences when people act against the word of God, but why is it that we all too often demand people operate very distinctly outside of the word of God? We do that sometimes, don't we? Somebody said finances would change. I'll tell you what, if you knew that things would be over, say, say for example, the Lord gave us a year, one year, not more, just one year. What would a person change? What does the Lord require of us? What did he ask of us? How many people would change something in their lives if they knew they had just one year? How many would change something in their lives? I'm curious. How many? How many would change something? You know, if the average person found out they had one year, they would start changing just about everything. They would. They really would. If they knew that for a fact, they would begin to alter just about everything. They would think differently about their issues and about their future. Things would become real to them. They would have a tight pressure also. But see, here's the problem. Here's the absolute problem. We do study prophecy. We know about prophecies. We know what's coming. We know that things have been gradually changing, but for some reason we're still not convinced that it will absolutely take place for us. We're not convinced. We know that things are close. We can see to that, but we're not convinced it's close for us. We read God's word and we bite our nails and scratch our heads on making change for years at a time. If I knew I had a year left, there would be nothing I would change because I make changes every single day. I know I may not make it till tomorrow. So in my personal life, I have to have everything done as though I'm not going to be here tomorrow. This is every day. As a consequence of living that way, I don't have the same pressures most people do, though in many aspects, my life may be worse than yours. You'd never know it. That's why I always tell you guys, this is not your paradise. See, something has happened where people really believe this is their paradise. They got to make their world here just like everybody else's. That happens through comparison, by the way. They have forgotten the purpose of life itself. Life has a purpose, but it's not the purpose humanity has defined. By and large, through education, men have defined what life is. And once you take that away, once you go back to the word like God define what life is, and if you happen to believe it, everything changes. Life was never to be a paradise. Never. What happens? Anybody ever, you, you ever sit down, right? And I know a lot of people, you don't watch movies anymore, but when you did watch movies, how many sat down to watch a movie? You thought it was going to be one thing, and it turned out to be something else. Anybody ever do that? Huh? And it, it works two ways. Sometimes you can sit down to watch a movie and you think it's going to be one thing. It turns out to be something totally different and you're just disappointed, right? You're just disappointed. Sometimes you'll sit down and think it's one thing and it turns out to be something totally different and you're absolutely blown away. You're like, this was really good. This was really good. We're like that in life. See, we're born and nothing is really speaking against what everybody is saying. And so many people think life is to live it up, to make life what you want it to be. And if you believe that, right, if you honestly believe that, then that's what you accept. And when it doesn't work out that way, you get miserable. You say that things are falling apart. It's kind of like, what if you didn't know people were supposed to age and one day you wake up and you got wrinkles You'd be disappointed. You say, oh, my life is over. What is this? It's not supposed to be this way. Oh, I'm so depressed. Can any of you hear what I'm saying? When you think life is exactly what humanity has defined it to be, you're going to get depressed. Do you know why? Because you're trying to make an end or some future happen according to what you've been told it should be. And when you don't achieve that, you get depressed. If we were to accept life as our father told us it was in truth, we wouldn't get upset. 
Why? See, the world tells you, they say, you know, you go out there and you be what you want to be. You go be successful. Success, 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 right? Go have a family, raise a family, just you and your family, and you guys live it up, and you guys have success. So what, are, what does a person end up doing? They break their neck to get a place. They dress their best to get a mate. They have children. They raise them according to the same things. And they continue on and they teach those values to their children. So in essence, people break to get a house, to get the best gadgets they can get, transportation, a roof over their heads, keep food in the house, dress as best they can, make a name for themselves in society, and that is their standard. Anybody object to that? That's pretty much it, right? If you look at it, that's, that's the basis of everything. So people strive to make that happen, don't they? And when it doesn't happen, they're like the world came to an end. In fact, most people get depressed because their life is not coming out the way man said it should come out. But your father never said that. You know, in the Word of God, you find things like, don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. What? Yes. So that means you're supposed to go through fiery trials. One of our hints of that was when Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost. That was no accident. The Holy Ghost led Jesus into the wilderness. Our father said, I put something, he said he put something before us, and you have to choose. What what did he put before us every single day? You have to choose out of the two things he set before you, life and death. Did he not put life and death before you? So life would be righteousness in the ways that are right. Death would be sin, the wages of sin is death, right? He placed before us life and death. He placed before us darkness and light. He placed before us good and evil, and we must choose. What did he tell us that he's going to bring us out of? Jesus, in fact, said, I came that you may have life. Well, if he came that we may have life, first of all, then we were in death. We had chose darkness, right? He said, I came that you may have life and I have life more abundantly. That's two things. In fact, in the Bible, it says he bought us from death to life. So that's confirmation that we were in sin. That's how all of us begin in sin. I know a lot of people try to act like that. They didn't, you know, that they've been squeaky clean all their lives. That's not the truth. So if you knew, if you absolutely knew that life was a crucible, it would change everything. If you knew that Life was nothing more than God's process to extract from us a truthful answer to his question he asks every single day. Even in the Bible, it tells us that he will ask this question every single day. We answer him with everything we do. We do. With everything we do, we answer him. So he placed before us something for this whole process. And we have an antagonist, and we have the righteous way, but we have an antagonist too. We have Satan. Satan is the opposite of our father's light in this world. He's supposed to be here. That's why he's not destroyed. Think about it. You have a lot of people going around, I'm going to destroy the devil. Jesus came not to destroy the devil, but to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus does not have to try and destroy the devil. He is a defeated foe. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil, though, here's what's going to get you. In the Bible, it says he came to destroy the works of the devil. But where does Jesus work? Where does he work? He works in you. He works in me. He works in those we don't think he works in. So the works of the devil are where? In us. In us. That's where the works of the devil are. Without us, the devil can't do anything, can he? And everything the devil ever did was through who? Us. He didn't do anything outside of us. He did everything in us, through us. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil work through us. He destroys those works. How does he do that? He told us how. He told us how to defeat evil, did he not? Did he not tell the apostle by the Holy Spirit and Romans 12, 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good? Didn't he say that? Yes. How can good 
overcome evil. Because evil is a concept. Although man often chooses it, they know nothing about it. They deny evil exists. They deny so many things are evil, it's not funny. That's what's bringing, largely bringing the consequences you see right now, and they're about to get far heavier than man ever imagined. And there's no forecast for it either. How do you overcome evil with good? That seems, you know, one of the first things you think of is somebody running at you, right, with a, with a handgun. How do you destroy the evil in that person with good? Can it be done? Most people would do what? If they had a firearm, they would end it. I know a lot of people like that. Some people would evade. Some people will do other things, but confrontation is one of the biggest things. One of the most pickable things people would do. Confrontation, some sort of confrontation. But how do you overcome evil with good? Do you know there are principles in this world that are seldom used? And because they're seldom used, a lot of people don't know about them. For example, how many of you are having a rough day today? I mean, you're just not, you're not... You, you know, I can almost perceive there are several of you that feel like you're, you're not, you're just, you're hanging on by a fingernail right now. Hanging on by a fingernail. Let me ask you something. You're hanging on by a fingernail. Your circumstances are not ideal. And you're saying to yourself, you know, look, I'm, I'm trying the best I can. That's what you're saying. I'm trying the best I can. And for some reason, evil or darkness or this chaos keeps popping up out of nowhere in many different aspects, and it just, you know, is, is blindsiding me. It's starting to get to me. Every time I try to do it the straight and narrow way, something happens. Did anybody ever say that? Every time I try to do it the right way. You ever have that complaint? Anybody ever have that complaint? You say, every time I try to do it the right way, something happens. You start, that's what you say. That's what you tell your friends or somebody else who knows about it, right? That is one of the funniest statements ever. Not to take away from your issue, but listen to what I just said. We do say and have said every time I try to do it the right way, which implies what? We've been doing it our way. Correct? Isn't that right? We don't trust it. We don't trust things enough to do what the Lord's way doing or what we call the right way. We don't trust the Lord enough, and that's what we do in our way. It's not necessarily the bad way. But we do admit to the whole world, every time I try to do it the right way, something happens. So we admit that openly. Without knowing, we're admitting that openly. We can do that because everybody else, it seems, is doing the same thing. Isn't that funny? So having confessed that we've been doing things our way, we also confess something else. Man, these problems have been a plague in my life. They have. They just keep coming and keep coming. And when I think they're gone, something comes up from another direction. What is it? I've tried to do it the right way. Isn't that funny? You try once or twice, three times to do it the right way. The rest is your way. And the problems keep coming. Why? Because we fail to realize, first of all, what life is in the first place. We are. We, we have, if life is a crucible, if life is where you make an honest decision between darkness and light, but we think life is what we've been taught to make it our paradise, right? To make it the way that man has described it, we're going to be upset on every single turn. I can't get upset if the father said, I'm going to have fiery trials. So when something comes, I'll say, ah, oh, well, there it is about time. Right? I can't get upset at that. There it is. There's my challenge. That's what I've been working out for in this fiery trial. Let me, in, let me employ God's way. He'll teach me in this. See, if I were to approach things like that, there's no burden in that. There's no burden. No wonder it says joy in tribulation. You should joy in tribulation. How in the world can anybody have joy in tribulation? Well, that scripture is very telling. Have you guys ever read that? This same thing pops out over and over again. So we're going to reveal two things real quick. First of all, to, to joy in tribulation sounds weird, right? 
to glory in tribulation is the exact word. That sounds weird. You guys think it sounds weird? Glory in tribulation. Can anybody do that? Well, you can. You can. If you know you're here for. You're not going to do that if you think you're here for what man has described. And how many times has the world described something to you that just wasn't right? And when you found out it wasn't right and you altered the way you thought about something, your problem went away. In fact, the problem you thought you had was not a problem at all. How many have gone through that? Hmm? Anybody? You guys have that scripture? The scripture about uh, when you're in tribulation? Anybody, anybody, anybody? What is it? Tell everybody what that passage is. Joy thing. Somebody says, count it all joy. Well, see, that's easier said than done. I'll tell you something. When you're in a turbulent time, you can't count anything all joy. When you're in the middle of it, right? Especially if you don't trust or know the process that the Lord has for you. You have no assurance of it. So how in the world? You can read that all day. You can read that all day, right? How in the world can you have confidence in that? How can anybody have confidence in that? You can read it. Again, you can read that all day, but it's very difficult to have confidence in something that you, well, that you don't know about. Let me read something to you guys. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with this, being justified by faith. How is somebody justified by faith? Can somebody explain that to me? What do you mean justified by faith? I want you guys to think of yourselves. Now, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have hang-ups. All of us have hiccups. All of us have issues. We have these things in our lives. But your faith specifically in Christ Jesus, in the sacrifice made for you, that your belief that Jesus died for you is everything. Even when you don't know the details, it is everything. Because you can't believe in that sacrifice unless God put that belief in you. That's why in your youth you believed. So therefore being justified by faith, because you believe, because you accept, the blood has you covered. So know that first. So stop hitting yourself on the back of the head. Stop saying all of what you messed up. Your father already knows. All of us know. All of us who have faced the truth, we already know what we have messed up. We're not here to count all the mistakes and losses. No. We're here to walk forward in a brand new way, in a brand new life, with a brand new vision, not keeping anything old. All things have passed away. Everything is new. That's why that scripture's there. Everything is new for those who believe. And because of your belief, that you're, just, you're justified by that, by the blood of the Lamb. That's the beginning step, right? That's the beginning step. So listen, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have peace with God outside of Christ. There is no peace with God through anybody else other than Jesus Christ. There is no peace with God through anybody else other than Christ Jesus. Do you guys hear me? Let me continue. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know that word glory is the power, the goodness, the totality of your Father, right? To rejoice in hope. Of the totality of your father. Think about that. To rejoice in hope of the deliverance of your father. To rejoice in hope of the redemption of your father. To rejoice in hope of the completion the father gives, right? To rejoice in hope of the newness he grants to you. That covers everything. Everything. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Why? How can anybody glory in tribulations? Here it is. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Your troubles, your troubles strengthen your patience. Thank you, Lord. Patience is something that not one human being has ever tried or knows how to strengthen on their own. There's something that you cannot do. Do you know that? You cannot make yourself patient. Patience must be exercised. 
It has to. And it has to be exercised from these unknown sources or else it's, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. When you have patience, right? When you actually have patience, do you not know you never get angry? There it is. There's one key. How can one get angry when they have patience? Patience. Do you guys know what that is? What is patience in the first place? Can anybody tell me what patience is? Because we hear that word all the time, but but are we familiar with what that word is? What, what is it? There's a person, he, he was called uh, Signs. We used to call him Signs. And he used to love to, to uh, Signs and some other folks would post these definitions. And I believe that uh, patience was hoop Omoni, hoop Omoni, or something like that. Anyway, patience meant endurance, 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 to endure something, to wait for something. That's what patience is. When you, when you get tired of waiting on something, that's when you're aggravated. That's when you're angry. That's when you're upset. When you have patience, you can wait forever. That's just like me, right? Just like me. I, I, I can't use you guys. I can use me as an example, a true example. Now, a lot of people used to ask me, they say, well, you know, I don't understand how you can be by yourself for years and it's no problem, right? That's what they would say. It's because I trust the Father and his choices, right? I really do trust that. I was talking to Angela. And we were, you know, we were talking together with Angela. I said, Angela, you know, I, this is when we first met. I said, uh, you know, I, I, I had no heart to date. any. I don't date anyway. There's commitment at the beginning, but I had no heart to even talk to anybody. And I told her why. I said, well, it's going to take me four years to get to know a person. It's going to take them eight years, right, to tolerate me. And if they can't wait eight years, they're not going to wait at all. So I can't deal with anybody with no commitment. If they can't wait, you know, for that four to eight year period, right, just to build up that that uh, communications foundation, well, then that's a waste of time for both of us. It really is, right? Why? Because I learned something. That if a person can wait on you, if you really can commit to a person, time is not an issue. It's not an issue. I also found out that when you truly do love someone, time is not an issue. It's not. See, commitment, with commitment, there is no time. There's no time whatsoever with commitment. There's only time when you, when, you're tr when you have a deal going, when you have an objective, something you have not communicated, right? You have a timetable. But when you're committed to something, there is no time. There's no time. I remember a lot of troops would go out to the field, be deployed, and not more than six months after they were deployed, their spouse was doing something else. Now, I was the one, in a lot of cases, who had to break the news to the people, right? Uh, your spouse is, wants a divorce or something like that because they can't get those letters directly. That would be devastating. And, yes, we do interfere, right? So that was bad. You, I see that all the time. I remember this one couple, right, this one group, one was male, one was a female. Both their spouses got together in the rear, got married while they went to war. Isn't that terrible? They were out there a year and two months when they came back. It was just, you know, that was a lot of counseling for them, too. I went through so much of that, so much of that. Seeing that over and over again, it, it, it was just, you know, I was like, what are these people doing? Well, the truth is they had no commitment. Normally, people have a plan, but no commitment. Commitment to care less about a plan. I'm telling you that now. Commitment can only be true if love is involved. You may say, well, how does a, since you were a soldier, what about those people who retire and still do things for the military because of the nation? That's commitment. That's right. They love their country. See, those who love their country, right, will always serve their country. Do you know that? Those who love their country, if they in fact love the country, now, they love it for their own reasons. I'm just expressing to you something. That when you love, commitment is a part of that love. And time does not exist. Our father, for example, he loves us. He has long suffering concerning us. Because he does not desire any of us to perish. He doesn't. But to come to repentance. And so when people say, 
you know, he's, 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 we should have been gone or something like that. Well, they, you know, they rightly say that, but God is long suffering. Why? He's committed to our salvation. Isn't that awesome? He could have thrown me away a billion times. So why am I still alive? Why are people still alive? They're not alive because they want to be alive. They're alive because the Father loves them. If a person is breathing right now, it's because of grace and mercy. That grace and mercy comes from the living God. Why do you think he fills you up with the word of God and gives you a passion to talk to other people? Hmm? Hmm? So that that person that you're talking to, see, he has to fill you up first. So he has to be patient with that. And he brought you through many people before you. That's commitment. He knew you were coming at the end. He did things with your parents, parents, parents. Whether good or bad, something happened that he purposed for them, and he saw you coming. And then he fills you up with the word of God and certain passions and has you go through certain things so you can go to certain people. Isn't that something? He's very patient. He's not going to wait forever, but he's very patient. He's long-suffering, the Bible says, to us where he is. So, let's, so that's what patience is. Now you guys know what patience is. Back to our reading here. So, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And experience hope. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean patience gives way to experience? Well, if you have to wait on something, you're observing. You're going through many different things. And as you go through many different things, you start coming to these conclusions. I've learned something, no matter how bad something looks, it never dictate. It, it will not dictate the outcome of anything. Your first initial impressions of something when it looks terrible, right, does not dictate the outcome. It never does. You dictate the outcome. You do. How many times have you gone into something that was, you knew you made a mistake, it was horrific and horrible, right? But some of you, you didn't know how to get out of it. You never had the solution. Your father did. Your father in heaven did. And somehow, you stayed along for the ride. You waited. You had no choice but to wait. See, in a lot of cases, the Lord will put you in a place where you cannot go left, right, back, or forward. You're stuck. And all you can do is watch. And you're saying to yourself, my life is over. This is it. You still continue. And you continue. And before you know it, the Lord has brought you out of this issue and that problem and this problem and that problem and this problem and that problem. And you don't know how you got out of those things. You can speculate all day. But the truth is you were delivered out of all of them. All of them. Now listen to me, those of you having a rough day right now. God delivered you out of countless things before, didn't he? Never forget how your father delivered you. Whenever you're going through a hard time where you have to wait for an answer, you have to wait for this, that, and the other, remember how he delivered you before. Always count your blessings and not your losses. Time for some real change. Not this talkative agenda change, right? But real change. Real change is when you start seeing the truth and you operate by that truth. Hmm? Operate by that truth. Operate by that truth. You're not dead you're here. You're right here, despite what you thought you were done for a long time ago. You didn't know how you were going to get out of those situations, but you're here. And guess what? God did not disclose all of your secrecy to everybody, did he? No, he did not. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if, if you were bought through your crisis, but all your dirty secrets were published? Oh, my goodness. How that, you'd rather be taken down in the crisis, right? Am I talking to myself or does somebody understand me out there? Just being real with you guys. Aren't these the issues that we really have? Aren't some of you happy that nobody knows the details? What happened in that conundrum, right? Nobody knows. The Lord did not disclose it to a soul. He didn't. He truly delivered you. He did. Remember those things. Remember those things. Not so that you can repeat the same things again, but to have confidence that he will still yet deliver you. All right, remember that. And hope, uh, or, or patience, experience, it gives way to experience again. When you're forced to wait upon things, you end up enduring many different things. You go through many different things. You gain experience. Experience you can gain no other way. No other way. And that experience, hope, once you have experience in your troubles that have worked patience, 
they gave way to experience in that trouble. See, that's why some of us have a lot to say. Some of us do. That's why some of us are not, you know, trying to sweep the dirt that we did underneath the carpet, but we utilize that. So somebody else can see, hey, I know your problem is bad, but the Lord can deliver you. And if you belong to him, he promised to deliver you. Do you guys hear me? If you belong to him, he promised to deliver you. He promised to. All of this gives you a hope. It really increases your faith. It does. Once you gain experience with deliverance, you're there. One of the biggest problems is a lot of people have no experience with deliverance. Second to that, they think life is something it's not. Life is given to you by the Creator. Life is for His purpose. There are a lot of people who will not make it in the next six months. They won't make it. Do you know why? They will drop dead out of fear. They're going to do something out of fear. Times are going to get quite fearful. It's my hope that you guys be ready for that. I don't care how much of a lunatic I would sound like. I care that you guys are prepared because I'll say it again. The day will come. When the average person is going to sit down in the corner of their house, they're going to be afraid to move left or right. They have not considered the weight and the gravity of what's coming. They have heard it said. They can debate about the subjects. I'm telling you now, the debate time is about to be over. That season is about to be over. All times of debating is about to be over. The illusion is about to be broken. When it's broken and truth is seen, I'm telling you right now, Many of you are going to find yourselves uncomfortable. There are common things people have forgotten. How can people forget so much? Before I take a break, now I'll do it after I take a break. I'm going to do something after I take a break. Because I want you guys to know the direction we're going. Especially here at COT in this season, 2024. I want you guys to absolutely know the direction we're taking. Once you know that direction, because I'll tell you, listen, listen. I am not here to catch and hook every and anybody I can. That's not what I'm here for. It is not what I'm here for. I can tell you right now, and so can the mods. When we start down that trail of spiritual truth and truth, and that spiritual truth includes life forms. It does. It includes life forms. It includes some of the greater truths about our planets. Some of the provable things about your life, even things about you. Do you not know that there, let me give you a small example of something, then I'll take a break. In the 90s, somewhere in the 90s, at NTC, a large group of soldiers saw something collectively. There was no denying it. But the same thing happened to a lot of people after seeing it. When somebody really sees something, first, their mind does not want to remember it. Your brain does not want to recall nor remember what you've seen. I could ask those people right now, do you remember seeing so-and-so? And they would say, yes, but but I don't want to remember it. That's what they'll say. I don't want to remember. We're, we're talking about hardened individuals. We're not talking about, you know, people who have not seen some rough situations. No, we're talking about people who have seen a lot. Their mind does not want to remember it. When somebody is, when they see something real, everything in you does not want to remember. In other words, you'll say, yeah, I saw it, but I don't want to remember that I saw it. That's what you'll say. Now, that's a confusing statement. It, it's not confusing to a person who's confronted with what everybody is about to see. Now, I'm saying this to let you know this. If the human mind does not want to remember what it just saw. How in the world are people going to make it through five minutes of seeing it everywhere? Everywhere. The Bible tells us some things, that the end times is not going to be something somebody can sit down and say, I told you that was going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. They're not going to say, I told you so. No one's going to sit back and eat popcorn, get their Coke and watch the end times. It's going to be an immersive situation. You have things beginning right now, and people are saying the same things. I don't, I don't want it to be that way. There are things happening around you right now that people are purposely ignoring. The Bible says they're willfully ignorant of the truth. Not willfully ignorant 
of some mystery, some theory, but of the truth. They don't want those components included in what they believe the end times are. It is not going to be conventional. I hate to burst that bubble. It'd be fine if it were just war, you know, full of components that we could understand, going in directions that we can predict. But no, the Bible clearly told us people are not going to have an answer for what's happening. We read about Revelation, that statement again, and in Revelation it tells us that a dark kingdom is rising. But what do you hear most Christians saying? Oh, God's not going to let a dark kingdom rise. You hear people talk about the Antichrist, and what do you hear people saying? God's not going to allow something like that to happen. They're in absolute denial. Absolute denial. They're not prepared. They're not. It's kind of like Texas, who has been repeatedly hit by storms after storm, and people are starting to lose everything. They've got some pop-up storms in the next 48 hours. It's going to be costly. People are not prepared. They're not listening. They're not. They don't want to face it. Simple truth. They can't hear. Why? Because it does not fit the paradigm of what they think their life is supposed to be. Everybody who believes their life is supposed to be outlined the way mankind has given it to them is going to be sorely disappointed. Now is the time to prepare like never before. No heavy thing has come yet. Not one heavy thing has come. Not one. But it is coming. And I'll say it again before I take this break. If mankind keeps lifting up himself, if people continue to choose one person over the other, if they're not calling upon their creator, the whole thing is going to be uprooted. The house is going to be missing from this nation. There'll be no house for this nation. Because if you take close note, they're using God to get themselves ahead. They're not kneeling to the living God. They're not pausing everything they do in view of the living God. They're using God to get ahead. They're using God to cultivate others. They're using him. Do they really believe that comes with no consequences? God is merciful. But you better believe his eyes are upon the place he has given so much power to. We'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Just a few seconds. Hopefully, somebody said, check the mic. What happened to it? Is the sound still okay, everybody? Hopefully, it is. If not, let me know when I come back and we'll get that squared away. I'm back. Let's see if this is better. Hopefully, it is. Everything should be back. We are at, we have good bandwidth, guys. We're going out all over the place for now. Everything should be good to go. Should be clear. Should be clear. Back to our conversation real quick before I go into another one. Patience and experience, they result in hope. And the hope maketh us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So what is the end result? Something that's very real. Something that if it's not, if it does, if it's not done, if it's incomplete, you'll be incomplete. Hear me. Romans 5.5 5 is the completion. The hope makes us not ashamed and it gives us a reason because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us now that's the end result of a tribulation my goodness so a tribulation results in the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts that's the end result not the other stuff right the other things so many people have made up over the years The end of a tribulation is the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Once you go through something, once you're delivered from something, and you believe, then you understand what your Father is doing if you don't soon forget it. Once you remember that, then that's when you start receiving the love of the living God. It is very difficult to receive the love of God if love is not being conveyed. What is this telling us? That God's love is absolutely conveyed right in the middle of a what? A trial. Your tribulations. You know, most people think the love of God is when they get a new car, but they have a payment. Most people think the love of God is when they can wake up and they have nothing to do. No. God's love is real. Love is an action. Love is God conveyed himself because God is love. 
when the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts, it's because you realize, because you've been through some things, because you thought you were kaput and you were not kaput, because you realize he delivered you, that you had no power to get yourself out of something. And it can only be him. Now that brings up something else. If you're in a position today, you're supposed to be in that position. If nobody can help you, it's designed that way. It's always going to be based on what you can and cannot receive. If the Lord wants you to know what he does, that he will deliver you, then you must be in trouble to be delivered. Do you guys see that? How you go through your trials, how you go through this is important. I used to fight my trials. I mean, as soon as they came, I say, nope, take it away. I don't do that anymore. I get quiet. I observe. Because you find yourself powerless. All too often you can't do anything. When you start seeing the Lord react, when he starts doing things, that you know can only be him. And you start thanking him because you know it's him that's key. But here, here it is. What trouble does the Lord have to bring in your life that you would finally realize it is he who delivers you? Hmm? See, some people have to go through something pretty harsh because they won't receive anything else. God wants you in this position because, listen, this is your breakthrough moment. When you're in trouble like this, I mean bad trouble, to the point where people start seeing it, to the point where you cannot hide it, I mean it's bad. Do you not know what happens at the end? When you maintain your faith and you're in this problem, you're doing everything to maintain your faith and people see that struggle. They're watching you. That's why they know about your trouble. I know it's irritating, but somebody's always going to know about your trouble. Maintain your course with the Lord in truth. What happens is they'll perceive a person who's gone through trouble. They're still praying. They're going to say, look at that dummy. They're still praying. They're in trouble. God's not delivering them. Look, they're in trouble. They'll count you out before, you know, the time is up. You just press forward in truth. They're going to still walk. You know what happens at the end of the matter? They have watched you go through this turmoil. It could last years. You don't know. But you maintain the course. You fought the good fight. They will have seen this. And when God delivers you, first, nobody else will be able to deliver you. Nobody. Nobody can help you in this. Nobody. Nobody. Your father will. They will see it. They'll say, no way. No way. This person was delivered from that I saw them pray. I saw them press forward. And you know what that person will say? That skeptic will say? They'll say, I want that relationship. That's the God I want in my life. That's the Jesus I want in my life right there. That one. That delivered that person. Because nobody delivered, delivered them but God. And you will know for the first time that your father can absolutely deliver you. When you know that, when you absolutely know that, there is no trouble for you anymore. How do you think the apostles could walk the streets under, under threat of everything and still have joy in the Holy Spirit? Because they knew what God's deliverance was. And so what I'm telling you is this. Your life, your, your, this crucible here is designed to grow you. You're giving an answer, yes, but you're growing at the same time. And it's real. It's not phony. I, I hate to say this, but most of the things that I have seen on this earth to a large degree have been just orchestrated phony. It's been phony. When you see a person really hurting, when you see that person abandoned by family and friends, when you see no one coming to their aid, when you see people count them out and everybody is talking negatively against them, people are watching. When that person maintains the course and they're still praying, even when things look horrible, and things drag out, and everybody's counted them out and said, I don't want to be like that person, right? The one thing they won't call you is a hypocrite. They won't. When you're in a struggle and you're trying to hold on to the Lord, they will call you stupid, but they will not call you a hypocrite. They won't. But when God releases you from that issue, when he shows up in that circumstance, when he delivers you, those skeptics will say, no person did this for them. Not one person... That was the true God that did that. They'll be your witnesses. That will cause them is Christ. 
You will have been used as a vessel to demonstrate God's deliverance in a true form right here on this earth. You know that. But listen, in order to do that, you have to go through something first, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? That's called being used on the Lord. See, people want this commercial version where nothing happens to them, where they get no scars, no wounds, nothing goes wrong, where they can still have their, you know, good time and then represent the Lord and they have no issues and no problem. That's not helping anybody because you have people out there hurting. They're in trouble. They don't know what to choose. They want something real just like you do. How many of you came to COT in the first place for something near that reason? You said, wait a minute. I want something real. I'm, I'm craving something real. I don't want the commercial thing anymore. I want something real, not made up, scripted, all this other stuff. You had seen all that before. You wanted something real. God knows I've always wanted something real. I told you, I've been on the other side. I've been in the back door. I can't take the scripted stuff. Like authentic things, unplanned, untested, real. That's what you've been set up for. You've been set up to do that very thing in a time where people really need to see it. You know, in the end times, the Lord the Lord said that many of you would be utilized to bring glory to Christ Jesus. This is the real way it happens. The real way. That's why you should never be afraid of tribulation. Many of you were born into tribulation. Don't ever be afraid of it. Understand what the Lord is doing. He's not doing it to break you down, to sit you in a, The only reason we feel broken down in the first place is because our vision is failing. What we wanted is failing. What we desired the outcome to be did not happen. And it has to be that way because it's authentic. See, when the Lord delivers you, you're going to be the first person to say, no one did this but my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not going to be able to say, well, you know, possibly it was that doctor there. Possibly it was this advice here. Possibly you, there'll be no possibilities. You'll say, no, the Lord delivered me. Do you know a person who's been delivered by the most High? Anything that comes is not going to intimidate them. You know what? They'll say, no. My Lord delivered me back then. He'll do it now. You'll be the one with that deliverance message. You can't tell somebody else they're going to be delivered. If you yourselves have not been delivered, it wouldn't be authentic. You can read about it and believe it, but how can you tell it? How can you truly be passionate about it and tell it? You can't because you have no experience with it. Do you see guys want to tell you? I, I, I don't get into subjects I have no experience with. If I have no experience, I have no passion behind it. And to me, that's phony. That's just as phony as baloney is. That's phony. If I have no experience with it, I can talk about it. And there are lots of things I cannot talk about, but those things I do talk about, I'm very passionate about. Because I know what the Lord can do. I know how people can do too. But I know what the Lord will do in the end. And I'm telling you something. It's worth every single heartache. Every single loss, it's worth everything. In fact, the greatest missing element in your life, that fulfillment you're looking for, I mean that true fulfillment of the heart, it's you having that moment with the Most High where he delivers you. That's your answer. That's what you're looking for. That's the fulfillment. Your deliverance is the fulfillment. It is that place you're attempting to reach, but you have no words for it. It's that thing you're looking for, but you can't describe. Hmm? And you've been set up for this. You know what stops us all too often? Is when a trial comes, we do not trust the Most High. You know, more and more people do not trust the Lord. Let me ask you something. If a person believes that Jesus is real and God is real, and a problem arises in the world, why would that person ever get nervous and tell everybody, we've got to do something. They would never do that, would they? If a person truly believes in the Messiah and they truly believe in the living God, they'll never get nervous and say, well, we've got to do something. They'll never do that. They'll have an understanding of how God works. 
They'll know the Most High will do something. They'll know that His way is already committed and His declarations will already come to pass. They'll have the greatest confidence no matter what time comes. See, those are the ones who will not take the mark of the beast. Those who take the mark of the beast are going to be the ones that say, I don't know how I'm going to make it. If I, I, I got to take it, I won't be able to make it. Then they'll abandon all things of their own faith. Those who know what deliverance is, they'll say, I'm not taking that mark or anything else. Well, how are you going to eat? How are you going to do anything? Well, that's not up to me. That's up to my father. He sustains me. He is my provider. How can anybody say that? Because they have experience. You all familiar with the names of God, the Old Testament? God, the provider, God, the deliverer, right? God, the, uh, my banner, all these different names for the most time. You guys familiar with that? The names of the living God. Hmm? El Shaddai, El Elyon, all those different names. Do you not know that those names were established after people had gone through things? And that's what they knew of their father. Those are not his names. Those are descriptions of him. His name is not provider. That's what he is. They knew him as God the provider. They knew him as God the banner. They knew him by these names. And do you not know, if you look carefully into your life, carefully, you're going to find that the Lord has set you up to know him by all those names. Do you know that? That you would know him as your provider. That you would know him as the one who heals. That you would know him as the one who sees. Huh? That you would know him as the one that goes before you. What do we do? When trouble comes, the first thing we do is what? Lord, take it away. Not knowing he sent it in the first place. The devil, this isn't Job error. This is not the Job error. You're under the rule of Christ. You are. Satan has little to nothing to do with your life except when he is used for you to make a decision between darkness and light. Those of you who have had these weird encounters, you were meant to have those encounters to solidify what God put in you in the first place. Every single last one of you who've ever had these supernatural encounters you already believed in the first place, but you began to listen to the world, and you, then you didn't believe. You began to believe the world's narrative. And the Lord said, oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. You are to know these things are real. Not so you can go write a book. No, so that you would know, because a time is coming when everybody will undergo what you underwent, when everybody will have night terrors. You know who's going to be covered from those things? Only God's people. Those who choose darkness will be eaten of that same darkness. What you've gone through is purposed. So then, eventually, eventually, you'll get there. And you too will say, Ibn has Izar. You know what that means? The stone of help. That's what that means. That means God's deliverance and his help and his methods and his ways are the most solid thing you can ever have in existence. Not just life, but in existence. You'll know it. But hear me on this. If you go by these dictates of the world, you're going to find yourself lacking. Now you know what the world is. Now you know why the Lord said, love not the world nor the things therein. Now you know why in the Bible it says, if you love the world, you have enmity with God. Now you know why the world fights to indoctrinate you every single day of your life. Now you know. If you don't believe that, as I'm talking to you right now, isn't, there, isn't your logical mind trying to fight against your spiritual mind? Right now at this very moment, there's a conflict in your mind. A piece of you that wants to hear and believe, and there's another piece that says it'll never happen. Isn't that negative part rising up as it always will? In the Bible, it says, your carnal mind is enmity towards God. Anybody know what that word carnal means? The true meaning of the word carnal? Why that word is used in the first place? Do you know what that is? This will really mess you up. 
People have made carnal out to be evil. That's not what carnal is. Somebody says flesh, here it is. Your natural mind. That's your common sense. Let me tell you something. That people tout that term all the time. Let me let me let me uh let me uh, explain this to you. Okay? I hear a lot of people say, Well, you know, the Lord gives you common sense. Yes, he, he gave us the flesh. But we are to be spiritually minded, which supersedes all common sense. Common sense is something everybody knows. To be spiritually minded is to see beyond what you can touch and see, to know the truth of the whole matter, not the piece of a matter. That's spiritually minded, and that's why spiritually minded is life. We've forgotten those scriptures. People have taken that term and have used it and abused it and caused it to be an offense. To be spiritually minded is simply to have the mind of Christ. That's what spiritually minded is, to have the mind of Christ. And to have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of the word of the living God. It, by the way, loves all things of the Father. It's just time that people look at what they're feeding within themselves. Somebody says, this is intuition actually the Holy Ghost? It can be. It can be. Those uncommon thoughts of truth that never make a mistake, it can be. Instinct is from the flesh. Sometimes dreams are from the flesh. Intuition, which can sometimes be instinctual things, right? You have to know the difference between the two. But if you're speaking, if you're speaking to those thoughts, those instructions we receive from time to time, that turn out to be 1,000% right, that we have failed to obey, then yes. Because the Holy Spirit never makes a mistake. It never makes a mistake. And you know what the Holy Spirit is doing? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God, which is poured out on all flesh. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. And he put his word that that convicted us, he put it to death and raised up a new one. That's why Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That's why Jesus said, I will pray to the Father and he will send you another comforter in my name. That's why. See, these things are for real. Don't let the world convince you that somehow it is not. Don't let some of these theologists out there convince you that it can be rationalized. If a person cannot see something, they don't add it into their theory. They don't. And they always end up changing their theories. I'll give you an example. Revelation. People have theories about revelation. So if an army came from the earth itself and appeared before everybody in the Middle East, People would change what they think about revelation. If a country appeared in the Atlantic Ocean, a landmass the size of Texas at first and then the size of Australia, if it appeared in the Atlantic within the next two years, people would change their theories about revelation. Jupiter began to ignite, but to a low but brilliant hue, people would change their theories about the end times in our solar system. When the water event takes place, people will change their opinion about the end times totally. If the stone steps comes to pass, folks will change their opinion about the elements inclusive of Trump. People make determinations based on what they can see. Your father does not want you to do that. He wants you to make a determination based upon the truth that you never have to change or remember something. The truth never has to be altered. Theories do, not the truth. Our Father wants us to have the truth, not a theory. He wants us to have the truth. Somebody says, how do you prepare? You must first prepare. You know, with the first step in your preparations should be something that seems a bit hard for people to do. And you know what that is? It's a very simple step. 
You have to let everybody be exactly who they are. Listen to me. If you get upset because of another person's choice, then you're not letting that person be who they are. Why would you get upset over somebody else's choice? If somebody chose, for example, in my life, because people have done this, people have chosen against Christ. I didn't get upset. You know why? Because I understand it's part of a process. Why would I get upset if somebody chooses against Christ? How many young kids do you know go to church on their own? Not many. That means there are many more who would like to play a video game and would dodge the whole question of going to church. Why would a person get mad at that when they know they're a child? If a person says no to Christ, obviously they don't know him, do they? Hmm? No matter how smart they appear to be, if a person truly says no to Christ, something is amiss. That means there's work to be done. Now, in that case, if you can maintain yourself, you, you shouldn't get upset. That person has to go through their process, just like we have to go through our process. Hmm? Somebody says, Mike, if I'd known them, what I know now, would have went to a different route in my career. I wouldn't have had you as my OIC games in theory. Oh, well, that's, a, that's an interesting field. Games in theory is uh, like predictive modeling, and we have an opportunity before us. And again, to truly prepare is for you. You've got to learn the concept of liberty, true freedom. Freedom is not what the world is saying it is, right? I hear, I hear that all the time, every single day. This Democrat, Republican, stupid feud that they're having is stupid to me. It is very stupid. I know they have different ideologies, but it's, it's incredibly stupid. For example, why, I keep talking to people about democracy. What is democracy? And people don't know. It's almost like they're forgetting. They don't know what democracy is. And then I've heard one person say, well, you know, democracy is, is it because it's not in the Bible. I, I'm not going to look at it. But you know what? Democ democracy is a word that describes the process. It describes something. That's all it is. It essentially describes part of the methodology and the roles being played in this very simple thing. You ready? You ready? People choose executive and legislative representatives, officials, to debate over policies that interest the people. Wow, that's it. That is it. That's what democracy is. That's what it is. That's it. Who are these government people? They're supposed to be representatives of the people who express the will of the people. And when they debate, that's democracy. Why is it that people don't know what that is? I'll tell you why. Because without you knowing, there's a doctrine that has snuck into the USA. And you guys are about to learn about this doctrine because it involves Christianity. Matter of fact, Saturday, I may go over it. There are 10, 10 pillars to this doctrine within the USA that's been in the USA for 21 years. And they have been steadily working. And many of you may not know it. But from time to time, I never said anything, but you have supported it without even knowing it. When we blow it up on Saturday, you're going to know the full thing. To me, it is against what the Messiah said. It has nothing to do with liberty. And it is the number one cause that many are going to turn against Christianity. It, do you not know, first of all, that a lot of people right now are turning against Christianity in the USA? And do you know why? Anybody know why? Somebody says we are a republic. Yes, but we practice democracy, right? That's what democracy is. Democracy is a method. It is a method by which we do specific things. That's what democracy is. A republic is what a democracy is found within. It is the practice of the republic. It's democracy. But people don't know the difference between the... They don't know what democracy is anymore. Right, because democracy is not ruling anything. Dem in fact, democracy governs the USA, and it is what everybody agrees is the method of doing things within the USA. Now, where does Christianity and all these other religions come into play? We're going to put those in their perspectives Saturday so that you know without a shadow of a doubt the simplicity of the whole thing so you can understand it. Because if you understand that, then you can hear politics and see exactly what they're doing.
your eyes will be open to something very simple. And it doesn't matter how many big words they use. It doesn't matter, right, how they use scapegoats and apple bottoms and all these, you know, different methodology of twisting subjects and evasion of, of all this other stuff. Right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Once you know the simplicity of the structure, which is very simple, you'll be able to hear everything they're saying. You'll see exactly what they're doing. You'll look through everything. But it's not good when the Lord said, the Lord Jesus said, what did he say about the laws of the land that you occupy? What did he say? What did the Lord Jesus say? He said, submit yourselves to earthly authority. Well, what if you don't know how that authority works? You're not going to be very submissive. And that word submissive does not mean bow down to it. That's not what it means. It's the same thing. Many of the evangelical Christians say every single day, it's the same thing. It's the same exact thing. It's just that people have taken it to an extreme, and they're not doing what the Lord Jesus said to do, and they have started to look to man instead of the Most High. The Most High will select the men who do things, right? We, by law, use a selection process, but we are to look to Christ for the solution, not to man. Never put a burden upon your fellow man that way. Never do that. But you live in a country, you live in a country where a, a, a type of doctrine has snuck. It, it, it is a real doctrine. People are working towards it. They're spreading propaganda within the church as they've been doing this for 22 years. And most people do not know about it. And the only reason I haven't bought this up it's because I, it, it is, I'm compromised in that area, meaning it does so much damage, so much damage, but you have so many people who support that, who have become callous, divisive, all sorts of things. They are active everywhere, and they have usurped the U.S. church by and large. That's why you see in the U.S. church is a mixture of politics with Christianity. A Christian does not choose sides among men. A Christian has the power of consulting the creator of this world to intervene in those matters of men. Jesus was very clear in his instruction to us. Why is it that we don't want to follow those instructions? It's kind of like when a person gets hurt, right? Somebody comes up and they say, well, I'm going to pray for him. And somebody else says, well, we don't have time for that. This person needs real help. Right? That's how people have become. They disregard prayer. They disregard the Messiah. When something really happens, that's when they do not trust in the Most High nor believe in Him. When they're playing church, that's when they seem to believe in Him. But when something happens, they shove it to the side. If they do things in a militant fashion, you think that comes without consequences. Get ready for your stomachs to turn. People are doing things they shouldn't do. Remember one time, I collected audio of many representatives because I wanted to demonstrate to people the true sentiment of what they thought representatives were, who they were, so they could see who they actually were. Of course, the Lord said, no, don't do that. But I did keep the audio. But it's absolutely disgusting. And it's very consistent because it never changes year by year. Because I often pray, Lord, to open the eyes of people so they're not duped. When I see a person saying, oh, so-and-so's a good man, and they don't know who the person is, right? That's how you know they're duped. In other words, they're, they're accepting what they hear without absent the Spirit. They're not depending upon the Spirit. And we do that a lot. That's what we do. We do that a lot. But see, here's the problem. We live in a day where the compromises have become so great where dark forces have become of such strength. The truth is right before everybody. But it's very difficult to see because of how this darkness is. This darkness has become so dark it's very difficult to see. Everybody has freedom to do whatever they desire. But I believe in the Lord's ways and I believe in his word as he is. They can amend documents men wrote. The Lord's word is as it should is it should stay as it is, as he intended it. I don't believe man has the answer. 
I do not believe that. And I believe that everybody's about to find that out. Unfortunately, one of the biggest betrayals in U.S. history is about to take place. And people are not really prepared for that. We face civil unrest. We live in a world with a fractured government where neither side will agree with the other. Families have split up over political identification. Isn't that sad? How can a Christian family break up over a political matter? That's going to cause a weakness. It seems the decree has already gone forward. In the depth of that weakness, the house will be uprooted. The house of this country will be taken away. That's the only way, the only way most people will accept any truth is when all of what they trusted in has failed. Why does it always have to work that way? Why? God has been so gracious, but let me let me tell you what the situation is. Think of a house, right? When it, when a whole family moves into a house, they're so appreciative of the house. They're excited, giddy. Ten years later, everybody's complaining about the brother, about the sister down the hall, about the person who keeps filling up the laundry basket, about the other person who won't shut the back door, about the individual who's always cold. Everybody has complaints. Now, they're all family, but they're full of complaints. Those complaints continue. They become bitter at one another. And then they start saying things like, well, I'm glad aunt so-and-so is gone because they always turn the heat too far up and nobody's comfortable. And the other person says, well, I'm glad so-and-so's gone because all they do is walk around with no deodorant on and that dead smell is killing me. And the other ones complain, even the kids complain, well, I'm glad so-and-so is gone because they eat up all the popsicles. But see, when they first got there, nobody had, they were just thankful for the house. But in their freedom and in their blessing, they turned sour. Why? Because they forgot the house was a blessing in the first place. That's why. When you forget the house is a blessing, that's when you start complaining from within. That's when everything has to be torn down so they can realize, understand, see what a blessing is again. When you forget what a blessing is, that's when the true teardown happens. And as it it turns out, when people begin to murmur and complain, that's when they have forgotten what a blessing is. This nation, the USA, is a blessing. It's a blessing. It really is. a Look at the other countries. Look at all of what they've gone through. We've gone through things too, but not like them. We have been blessed beyond measure. And people take full advantage of it. We have an overabundance here in the USA. Everybody has an overabundance. If that weren't true, everybody would be skinny. We live in abundance. We live in overruns. Even the poorest of the people are richer than, far richer than everybody else out there. And what do we do? What have we done? We turn against each other. We try to dominate each other. We have become hostile to each other. We're paranoid of visitors, skeptical of neighbors. We take everything from everybody. And the only time we're satisfied is when we manage everybody else's stuff to make sure that we can control them so they can never control us. Now all we do is complain about each other. That's what you see in the White House. All they do is complain about each other. They've forgotten that they've been blessed. They've forgotten how many people lost their lives in building this nation. What had to take place for us to be in this position to have this overrun. They have forgotten the cruelty involved the bloodshed, the eradication of certain peoples. It took all that to get people to become humble enough to see we have to build together. The wars came because they had slightly forgotten then. After World War II, people who were in those wars, they wanted nothing to do with war. They said, no, we got to build, we have to build together. They got away from racism and all that stuff. Did you notice that? They started actually fighting that. They said, this stuff is no good. They began to root up those complainers and people that caused these issues. Prosperity came back. And in the 80s, people enjoyed themselves and the entertainment was all over the place. And it was, uh, the 80s was, it was truly a golden year. But then the 90s came. 
in the 90s, more people, the children of the spoiled adults, the children of those who had too much entertainment grew up. They didn't have a very good foundation. They don't know about the struggle. See, those who knew about the struggle, they wanted nothing to do with struggle and could appreciate where they were. But a generation came up that knew nothing about the struggle. They started to create these weird things. Entertainment became the order of the day. And they began to serve entertainment. And they saw no point to other things that stabilized society. Music became hypnotic. And then it went over to the Christian community. Where the music in the Christian world sounded just like the worldly music. Then they bought the worldly stuff inside the church thinking it was harmless. Then people in, on these television shows began to adjust their kindness to a strange degree. And before you knew it, more and more people were involved in the changing of, well, you know what? That men should be far more caring. That women should be have more control. And, of course, that obviously led to something else because they took it too far, left unchecked. It happened. All of a sudden. Other people popped up and began to fight against those who were establishing these new ways, blaming them. And then we had small hiccups due to greed, simple greed. We had greed. And everybody started blaming everybody for everything that happened because of greed. Because all people wanted to do was make entertainment. Nobody wanted to make anything else. Until we became a country who basically made entertainment. And that's all we did. The biggest industry in the USA was Hollywood. And, of course, the music industry. That's what we did. That's all we did. And we knew we were in trouble, and so we sent out agents to help manage everybody else's stuff they were making because we didn't make anything else. They junked the steel mills, started to scout the coal industry, oil industry, all these industries that actually took labor nobody wanted to do. Remember the time when nobody wanted to work? But they couldn't find people who wanted to take out the trash. They couldn't find people to do any hard labor. So they hired, what, immigrants. Because nobody wanted that job, stocking shelves. Nobody wanted the job, recycling trash. Nobody wanted the job doing those things. So they hired immigrants. Everybody wanted to be rich. Nobody wanted to take out the trash. As a consequence of that, we opened the doors. And we left the doors open, and we became slack, and our security of this nation totally got off balance and off point. Now we became a country who totally forgot about their past. People were disinterested in those things of the past. They even misrepresented the past by thinking of new and innovative ways to express the past to children, indoctrinating an entire generation and a very loose foundation of how we became a nation in the first place. And everybody wanted to be rich still, but a generation came demanding that they should have everything. Then the people who remembered the sacrifice started to rise up again, saying, we're going to lose it all if we continue in this route. But by then it was too late. Nobody wanted to hear the rantings of an old person. So here we are, with the whole house falling apart. And why? We became fat and lazy, forgot the struggle. All of us ate too much, and we desired everybody wanted the money and the green, and they did everything for money. And they abandoned the foundation. Most have forgotten about the Creator. So here we are. Here we are. Can't you see what they struggle to do? They're struggling to get the entertainment industry back, and it's just not like it was before. China said, no, we don't need America's entertainment. That's what China said. Do you guys realize how much money Hollywood was making from entertainment? That they influenced just about every law the government ever had, Hollywood did? That by a movie, they could cause everybody to become a certain way? That's how much power they had. Nobody wants to lose their power, and now they're fighting over it. They're fighting over power. They're not fighting so that you can have a better life. They're fighting so they can have their power back. 
That's all they want is their power over people again. All they want is security themselves. So all of them have this harebrained idea that, well, you know, my plan is the best plan, right? When you want financial security for yourself so no one can make you poor, that's when you utter the statement, I'm right. I have to do it my way. When you're looking out for the people, you say, we need to do it their way. When you're thinking about yourself because you're frightened that somebody else may someday exercise power over you, you want to do everything your way and in a hurry. Out of what, though? It's that self-protectionist thing, that survival instinct. This is where we are. Now everything is being defined by science. And if it cannot be defined by science, people won't accept it at all. There goes faith. These new kids, that's why it's hard for them to believe things of faith. Because they can't find it on YouTube. Internet has become something like the Holy Ghost to these people out there now. If they can find it on the Internet, if they can corroborate something through the Internet, find it five or six times through worldly people, it's okay. You're not going to find spiritual things through worldly people. It's not going to happen. Can you see a breakdown? Can you see that the only way out of this, the only way out of this is to restore a sense of truth back into the people again. What does that mean? The same way God has done this from the beginning. When people get to this stage, their kingdom falls. And when the kingdom falls, people do wail, but they begin to remember what it took to have that nation in the first place. Then they repent collectively. Then they realize they went too far. Only then will they change their ways. What the Lord is doing, He's doing for real. Our Father is not a gambler. He's doing what he's doing for real. And he's very serious about humanity's salvation through Christ. And some people will not pay attention until they're forced to. So when the house is gone, then they realize what they were blessed with. That's when they realize what they took for granted. That's when they repent. The losses are coming. Folks, that's all I have for you tonight. That's it. Somebody says, too late for this country? Well, the people are the country, and it's still up to us. Here's a question. Can us, can those of us who believe in Christ, could we get together with one message? Because if we can't do that, how could we ever expect anybody outside of those who believe to come up with anything? If we can't even agree on one thing, how can they, who have no spiritual authority, have an agreement on anything when they're infested with darkness? Our Father has that solution. I'm very interested in the Father's solution, not man's solution. If it's not clear yet, man has failed miserably time and time again. Father has decreed his solution. Somebody says, Mike, how does entertainment, music, use witchcraft to influence people through getting us to agree with it just by showing it? No. Well, no, if you listen to it or if you watch it, right? anything you listen to, anything you watch becomes a part of your world. Believe it or not, you have to deal with it. That's one layer to it. So everything you see in life, I want you to take the rest of today and just examine people. Everything they do is emulate. They're emulating what they have seen somebody else do. A baby emulates their parents. That's all they do is they recreate or they repeat what they have heard. By and large, activities, even people getting upset, they emulate what they have seen. There are themes to these movies and these songs that people hear. Songs affect people emotionally. When you feel a certain way, right, especially for young people, there are songs that they go and listen to that interpret their feelings. That's called programming, just so you know. Movies can make you interpret things a certain way. Suppose you have an issue in life. Well, s women, don't they go to Lifetime to watch a specific movie just like that thing they have in life? To do what, though? To have somebody to talk to when they have no one to talk to. So when they watch that movie, they can relate to it. But what they don't realize is that th that movie interprets what they're going to see coming out of their own situation, programming, right? Here's the other part you don't see. 
the songs that are made, they used to do this. The songs that are made, they have a witch's guild. They get together. They have a ceremony over the songs before they are published, right? So they pray that a demon go with every song and every copy of that song that's going to be played so that the person, their emotions are enhanced in a certain way, right? Now, what would be the proof of this? How is it that people that don't know each other can dance the exact same way on a song when the people are of different cultures? How can they dance the exact same way? How can they have this similar or same body? Oh, that's been studied. That means something is connected to that song that uh, probably shouldn't be there that has an influence on the person. It's a known fact they used to do this, especially over the radio. Every single song is anointed by them, by the little warlocks and witches, that a demon be with that song as it plays, that it affect everybody who listens to it the same way. They do it for movies, too. They even do it for the people in the movies, which is why you have a lot of people. When they find out about this, they say, no more. My career is not going, you know, any further than that. I'm not doing that stuff. That's why you see people like, uh, I don't know, Taylor Swift, right? When they have the concerts with the demonic entities and the incantations on the stage. Anybody who's doing that, you're going to notice a theme. Why do they always have to have a dedication to demonic entities? Why do they always have the same demonic iconography in their concerts? Why do they always have a sacrifice, a mock sacrifice in their concerts? Always. From the rappers to the... All of them do the same thing. If you make money in this world, you're going to have to agree with those who control the money, period. There you are. You get to a certain, you don't get to a certain level without some sort of agreement. Because once you get to a certain level of money in this world, you're handling somebody else's money. They have to agree for you to be a billionaire. They have to agree for you to be a multi-millionaire of a certain degree. And once you agree, you're on a contract. You're under a con- contract to do exactly what they want, which is why good people turn sinister after this stuff. A lot of people will tell you straight to your face, especially nowadays, but people don't care anymore. They don't care. They don't care about Azuzu, Hazazel, and all these different names that are evoked in these songs. It's not secret anymore. They do it right in front of people's faces. Some of this is they agree for you to win some lotto winnings. I heard something one time about the lotto. One time, just one time only. I didn't want to hear it either, but I heard one time. An agreement is in it, and I heard that part. An agreement is in it. and uh, But the people are not ordinary people, put it that way. They know about the numbers. Right? They know how numbers work. They know how chance works. Do you not know you can predict the numbers in the lottery? When you do a random number selection under a, it's called a dark test, right? What it, what it means is the inverse statistics is what you have to study to get those numbers and then come out every single time. That means you could take 20 bucks and win it, you know, a lot if you wanted to, at least once a month. That's why I don't do things with numbers involved. That would be manipulation. Once you learn certain things, you don't engage back with the public again. The father would skin me alive. I did that. Folks, listen. God bless each of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. I'm going to see you then. Thank you guys for your support. Remember, listen, we have, uh, we do have our you know, broadband going again, right? But that was, uh, that was because of you guys. It is there now, but there's no guarantee on it. We just operate as we get it. Just remember that, okay? Just remember that. But we do have some things going up on the site, as promised. So everybody's in the clear because we have more COT sites out there, right? And some more people have written me saying, did you get the big donation? No, I didn't. Because it went to somebody who was not COT. There are people out there impersonating Mike from around the world. It's not going to end. All right, it's not going to end. So if you guys come across anybody that's donating to somebody outside, counciloftime.com, Right. Uh, and it's another page acting like their council of time that come. Just tell them that's not.
that's not the real. Now, I'm not talking about people like Daily Excellence. God bless them for that. I'm talking about people who impersonate Mike from around the world and Council of Time. They're out there. They have full sites. And people are donating to these people. And they're replaying our audio on their sites. So if you went to one of those sites, you think you were at Council of Time, right? So I've, got, I've looked at a few of them. And I'm making some adjustments to our publishing, right? I know that anything I would have published before then, they would have just got replicated it. Because all you have to do is copy the content. So I'm making that a little difficult for them this time. So they can't just copy stuff and throw it up on their site. So uh, that's the way they were, okay? And people do. They end up finding Council of Time. Some, somehow they find councilftime.com and info at councilftime.com. And they're right about their donations they've been giving. And I have to tell them, you didn't give to us. And they'll give me the domain name and everything. And they'll say, oh, that wasn't y'all. No, it is not. No, it is not. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. But I don't want people to be, you know, victimized. Like Now, those people out there that are doing that, they'll get what's coming to them. They will. You can't impersonate a website and a name and get away with that stuff. Right? You can't do that. But they're out there doing that. But you guys know what that is, right? That's, that's an attempt. You know, people do weird stuff like that. They don't know why sometimes, but they do weird stuff like that. Because they're, you know, nudged by darkness to try and uh, oppose what we're doing here. So, But I'll tell you this. The Lord said, just like he told the, uh, just like one of the, uh, one of the Jews had told some of the other Jews, he said, be careful what you do to these men. Because if if they just created this by themselves, they're going to go into nothingness. But if God has actually assigned this to them, right, then if you, you start going against them, you're going to go against the work of God and you're going to pay the price for it. So I know that people who are trying to do sneaky stuff, they're going to pay their own, they have to pay for their own price for that. They will. They're going, they'll pay for it. They'll not get away with it. Also know that if we, are ever compromised by what they're doing out there, right? We're not going to be blessed for that, okay? We're just not going to do that. So anyway, that's where we are. Our financial pages are going up too because I, I would like for you guys to know exactly what we're having. That way people don't start the little rumors, right? I know that there's a lot of people who talk about Mike from around the world, COT, and they have, you know, a lot of people, they're having conversations. Somebody said that... Uh, I think somebody had included Angel and I said, oh, yeah, those guys, they make millions a month. If that were true, no, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work at all. We, we, we do good to get, you know, sometimes people do. They are generous. Sometimes you're generous. Average, though. We are, we're pretty even around about twenty five to 3000 a month. Which is a blessing. Anything is a blessing, right? But it's nowhere near uh, what people are talking about out there. So once asked me, public, right? Because our only avenue there is PayPal. I said we do it through PayPal. I like that. Everything is consolidated. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny paper trail. So that's good. Yeah, it says CO time. It sure does. That's a subsidiary. That's what it is. But that's what it is. That's how it is, guys. That's where we are. That's where we're at. So we do what we what we can do with what we got. But take note, that's how Satan works. Now, when the people overcome, right, things, when the people overcome things, when the people are blessed, COT is blessed, right? I do not expect to be blessed. If, the pe if you guys don't have a breakthrough, we should not have a breakthrough. That's a fact. That's a fact. Tell Paul, COT, no, we don't need webinars. I, I can't. I'm, me personally, I'm going to share this with me personally. I'm forbidden. I won't sell any content of anything, including the word, on this site. That'll never happen. That'll never take place. I personally, that, that's a personal thing for me. I can't do that. It's not wrong for other ministries to do that. I just can't. I can't do that. I personally can. I'll never do that. I'll never do that. So that, that won't happen here. What I have for you guys You'll just get, right? You'll you'll get it, uh, but I can't sell it. I'm not selling. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I have real my have real quirky way as I do, but when it comes to the Father uh, and my Lord, 
very serious all the time. I mean, all the time. I'm the guy from the bushes. How about that? Folks, talk to you guys tomorrow. God bless each of you. And remember, Friday, Friday, look at the schedule. It's a presentation Friday. It is. So I hope those who are researching Jupiter have not stopped researching Jupiter or certainly watching it. It is a beacon. We are about to endure a season. Nobody ever thought would come so quickly. We are. And it is a celestial change. And it will never go back to normal. Right? But you're here in this time. Right? You're here in this time. Your purpose to be here. You're the ones that will see it, as it turns out. It is closer than you think. And I'll do my best to keep you guys updated. But you're going to see it with your own eyes before I can totally explain it to you. God bless you guys. I'm going to see you next time right here at COT. God bless.